just as that thief hung on the tree next to Christ the surety oh Lord remember us oh Lord remember us and as Stephen was being stoned and God stood up there at his throne oh Lord remember us oh Lord remember us cause some will stand before the throne but some will stand in Christ alone Oh, Lord, remember us. Oh, Lord, remember us. As you've said, and we believe, all who ask, they shall receive. Some will stand before the throne, but some will stand in Christ alone. Oh, Lord, remember us. Oh, Lord, remember us. When you come back with trumpet sound, saints rise from the ground oh lord remember us oh lord remember us the sun will stand before the throne but some will stand in christ alone oh If you would turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 this evening, and as you're turning there, I just want to use uh, my last opportunity to speak to all of you at once and say thank you for just a beautiful time. I, I love this church, and I love your pastor very much, and I'm thankful for you to be a part of this. And such a blessing to hear these men preach the gospel and to worship together. Look what God has arranged. What a blessed time. What a precious thing that the Lord has arranged. And, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith 
should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now you'll all know that the city of Corinth was a great and decadent city. It was a place where philosophy was held in great esteem and was much engaged in. Man's wisdom and intellect was on display there like nowhere else, I guess, on the earth. And this is the folks to whom Paul said, I didn't come with enticing words of man's wisdom. I didn't come with great rhetorical persuasion or oratorical skills. And he gives the reason why he did not in verse 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. If I convinced you of something, if I talked you into something, it would be an abomination. If I talk you into doing something for God, it'll be sin, whatever it is. But in the power, the Jews had a form of godliness, but they denied the power, the authority and the ability of God. Your faith must be rooted in God and what he did. And nothing that we say, if we speak to entice you, to persuade you to do something, there won't be any blessing, there won't be any salvation, there won't be any grace. God does not use that. Paul said, I did not come that way. A crafty man can use convincing words and get people to walk an aisle and they can impress with their big words and turns of phrase and it will profit absolutely nothing. And Paul was a well-taught scholar. He could have impressed people if he had wanted to. He was in the business of impressing the flesh, if that had been his purpose. But he said he determined to know nothing except that which the flesh has no interest in. The Greeks seek after wisdom. The Jews seek for a sign. And we don't give them either one, but we give them both. In another sense, right? Because the true power of God is the preaching of Christ. And the true miracle. You looking for a miracle? Let's see if God has mercy on a sinner tonight. And we'll see the greatest miracle creating the universe was nothing compared to to creating a, 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 a clean spirit in a sinner. And that's the power of God. God who commanded the light, who said, let there be light, shines in hearts too. To give the light of the knowledge of his glory in the face of his son. Jesus Christ and him crucified. The flesh, like somebody said this, this morning, I believe. To, to this world and to the religion of this world. The preaching of Christ is boring. They're not interested. There's no excitement there. There's no, no beauty about that that they should desire to hear of him because to them there's no beauty in him. We could generate more interest if that's what we wanted to do. We could fill this building and... and building 10 times this size if that were our goal and it is the goal of most of religion all of religion but what would we do with a building full of fleshly religious self-righteous people there'd be no worship Christ wouldn't be glorified nobody would be saved Turn with me to Galatians chapter 1, please. Verse 6.
Paul said in Galatians 1, 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. It doesn't matter what it is if it's other than. <laughs> what difference does it make what they call it? What difference does it make where it originated? What man, you know, started it? And let's study false religion. Why? If it's not Christ, it's not God's gospel. <clears throat> As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Now you think about that for a minute. Why didn't he use enticing words of man's wisdom? Because we're not trying to persuade you. I want something for you very badly. The Lord gave you a pastor after his own heart, and I guarantee you he wants something very badly for you. But he's not going to appeal to you for it. He's going to appeal to God for you. We're not persuaded. We're not in the business of persuading men. Do I persuade men or God? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Is that what we are? Servants? Are we ambassadors for Jesus Christ? I couldn't convince you of your sin, no matter how persuasive I might be. I can't convince you how bad you are. I can't make you to know the Lord God, no matter how eloquently I might describe him and tell forth his glories. I can't. I can't reveal Christ to you, no matter how badly I may want to, or, or how skilled an orator I may prove to be, but God in one moment, with a single act of his will, in the time it takes to turn on a light with a word from the throne of God. Now, a word that maybe you've heard all your life. You may have heard it a thousand times before, but without result. But if the Lord says the word, you'll know him. You'll hear his voice and you'll know him and you'll follow him. So you... We need to always be aware and conscious of what's happening here. This is not a man trying to persuade you to be something, do something, act a certain way. We don't persuade men. And how in the world are we going to persuade God? <laughs> well... I think this is, this is probably a good idea. Let's do what he said do. Let's, let's, do. let's say what he said he will use to save sinners. God, if he turns the light on, you'll see in a minute, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, you'll see how he can be just. And justify you. I couldn't convince you of that in a, in a thousand lifetimes. He can speak life to your heart. And just like that, you'll live. The time of love comes. And he passes by and says, live. So what I want to do, and I guarantee you what your pastors want to do, what these preachers want to do... We want to make it as plain as we possibly can. And when I say us make it plain, it's not that the word of God is complicated and we have to break it down somehow or another. It's because we and you 
we complicate things. <laughs> the word is not, com the gospel is not complicated. But we tend to want to add our ideas in there or we th think like most of religion does. If we just, if we say it a certain way, if we say, if, if we are convincing enough. Well, I don't want to be obscure. I want to be clear in the preaching. That's, you know, that's, I, I, I guess I speak for these fellas. The greatest compliment you can pay a, a preacher is to say that was clear. That was so clear. If it's Christ, if it was clear nonsense, then it's just clear nonsense. <laughs> but if it's the gospel, that was so clear. So, by God's grace, may we do what God has promised will result in the salvation of his people. I want you. By, 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 by God's grace, I desire for you to know him. I love that sign back there. Sir, we would see Jesus. That's so simple and beautiful. I would see him. And I want you to see him too. Isn't that the way it is? He makes us like that, doesn't he? Come see a man that told me all things ever. Is not this the Christ? Is not this the Christ? What must happen is for God to do something for you that I cannot. As much as God has knit our hearts together and wants and puts the desire in our heart for you to know him. And I want to know him. After Paul knew him for a long time, he said, oh, that I may know him. And you can't do it for yourself. So what means has God revealed that he will use to bring this about? Paul gives it to us in our text. And we, we find it throughout God's word. I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and what he did. What he accomplished. Him crucified. 1 Corinthians 1.23 We preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Paul said in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, though nobody much wants to hear it. Who hath believed our report? Though it's not popular, it's despised in this world. But it's the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Well, some say, well, Chris, there's a lot more in the Bible than Christ. You know, what else do you preach? Don't you preach on sin? We need, to, we need somebody that'll preach against sin. You're not ever going to know what sin is until you see Christ crucified. You're not going to have any idea. And if there is anything in your Bible besides Christ, then you've never understood a word of it. Job said in Job 42, 5, I've heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eye seeth thee, wherefore I abhor myself. You're not ever going to have any idea what sin is. When you understand what sin is, you're not going to hate sin. You're going to hate you. And that happens when the Lord reveals himself in the preaching of who he is and what he did. When do you know enough about sin? When you can't stand yourself. When you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God's got to put you in hell.
It's the only thing to do. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's what it is to sin. To come short of his glory. Now if sin is coming short of God's glory, then if you're ever going to know the extent of sin, you must know something of that glory. How are you going to know that? Not by examining your sin. By looking to Christ. The glory of God is seen in his face. <clears throat> Don't you preach on hell? You got you to gotta warn people about hell. You want to know what hell is? It's wherever Christ is not. Can you think of a better day? I've been thinking about that. It's wherever Christ, in his blessing, in his mercy, in his grace, in his life-giving presence and light, is not. If heaven is to depart here and be with Christ, then what is hell? Hell is where everybody who hates Christ deserves to go, Paul said. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha, accursed when the Lord come. It's righteous, just punishment for crucifying the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the condemnation. That light came into the world. And we hated God's light and loved our sin. You want to know what hell is? Who is it that has the key to hell on his finger? The Lord Jesus Christ. You can't preach on hell without preaching Christ. Let's just preach Christ and we'll find out everything we need to know about hell. We determine to know nothing else. That's a determination, isn't it? <laughs> it's a determination. That don't just happen. That's the grace of God. What is it to preach Christ and him crucified? Well, first of all, it's to preach him who he is. Everybody knows that somebody named Jesus died on a cross 2,000 years ago. But who is he? I've been, I was in religion for a, a long time as a teenager for many, many years. And you know what their definition, the definition of the gospel. This was asked a lot. What's the, def, what's the gospel? It's the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. The only problem with that is which Christ are you talking about? There are many false Christs. And this is... I believe preeminent who he is because what he did, the death, burial, and resurrection, it doesn't mean anything unless he is who he is. Think about this. He said he called, what was the name that the Lord, that, that Paul gave him? He could have said, we preach the Lord and him crucified. We preach God and his son crucified. We preach Christ, the anointed, the title of God's Messiah, the Christ, the Christ. Every Jew knew that whoever the Christ is, is God in human flesh. They still know that, and most of them are still looking for him. We preach him. In John 10, 24, the Jews said to the Lord, If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. And he did tell them. And they took up stones to stone him, saying this, You being a man, make yourself God. That's the Christ. If you be the Christ, tell us plainly. And he told them, You're saying you're God. They knew what it was. 
who the Christ was. They just despised him when he stood right there in their midst. He is the anointed son of God sent to honor the law of God and redeem his people. Paul said in Romans 8, no one can lay anything to the charge of God's elect for a specific reason. It is Christ that died. It's the, he's the Christ. The one who, because he died, those whom he died for stand uncondemnable in the sight of God. Because he died, because this Christ died, nobody in heaven, earth, or hell can lay a charge against me. Oh, that's who he is. God's anointed, exalted son in human flesh. God, the fullness of the Godhead in a body. It's he who was prophesied by Isaiah when he said unto us, a child is born. Unto us a son is given. That's not God repeating himself. When that baby was born in a manger, God was giving us his son. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. What government? The government <coughs> shall be, and his name shall be called Wonderful. <laughs> Counselor. Do we call him wonderful? Wonderful. Counselor. The mighty God. The everlasting Father. The Prince of Peace. <laughs> if you've seen me, he said, you've seen the Father. Now, this is of the utmost vital importance because if the Jesus of religion died to make salvation available to me and then leaves the deciding of the matter up to me, then I've got a problem because I'm dead. I'm dead in trespasses and sins. But if the mighty God shed his blood for me, Who is he, Isaiah? He's the mighty God. That's who he is. That's who we preach. The one who saves whom he will, when he will, as it pleases him. Then who shall condemn me? It's Christ that died for me. He's the one who Isaiah describes in Isaiah 42, 21. The Lord is well pleased. For his righteousness sake, he will magnify the law and make it honorable. He is the one described in Isaiah 53, 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. We preach him. We preach the one that took our place on Calvary and God's wrath was poured out upon our substitute and not us. He bore our griefs. He carried our sorrows. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was on him and with his stripes we're healed. We're not given an opportunity. We're not given a choice to make. Whoever he shed his blood, whoever stripes were laid on him, whoever he was bruised for their iniquities, they're healed. They're saved. Who he is, the Son of God, the Christ, the Anointed, God in human flesh, all the fullness of the Godhead in a body. He spoke and it was done. He touched and life was given. He still does. 
and it still is. What did he do? Christ and him crucified. What did he do? Well, he did what he came to do. He saved his people from their sins. Matthew 1.21 For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. Why did he do that? That he might bring us to God. Us between whom there is a great gulf fixed. Because of our sin, because of our fall, because of our nature, because of our natural condition. Dead in trespasses and sins. Separated from God forever. But Christ suffered for this reason, to bring us to God. That he might bring us to God. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. You know, that could say, I don't see any reason why that couldn't say, Christ hath made redemption possible by being made a curse for us. There are a lot of opportunities in the scripture where that could be portrayed. Instead of saying it's finished, he could have said it's available. <laughs> Christ hath redeemed us. He accomplished it. It's done. He said it's finished because it was. And it is. Being made a curse for us. Galatians 3.13. We quoted a while ago 1 Corinthians 1, 23 and 24. The preaching of the cross is either foolishness to you or it's the power of God. And you know what it depends on? And this may be a strange way to say this, but you know this is right. It depends on whether you're a sinner or not. Are you a sinner? If you see no need for your sin to be dealt with in this way, you know, you've kind of got it. You've got it under control. I'm a sinner. But my good outweighs my bad, you know. And the Lord's going to pick up the slack. I'm going to do my best. The Lord's going to pick up the slack. Then the cross is foolishness. It's foolishness to the self-righteous. The preaching of the cross, it doesn't recognize any of man's claims of goodness and ability. Man says, well, if my good can just outweigh my bad, and the cross says, you don't have any good. It took the blood of God to pay for your sin. But if God has shown you your true condition before him, this preaching is the power and the wisdom of God. It shows you that your faith should be in the power of God. There in Romans chapter 3, I believe it is, that, uh, where, where Paul says, through faith in his blood. Do you believe in his blood? The power of God in human flesh shedding his blood for a sinner. Is that where your faith is rooted? power of God to put away sin, to bring in everlasting righteousness, as we read a minute ago, to be just and justify sinners like me, and God by the death of his son. His Christ crucified is the wisdom of God, is the solution to the unsolvable dilemma, Darius's dilemma. How can the king honor his own law? And yet set the sinner free. Daniel, is your God able? Why did he die? Look at John 19 with me. I, I don't want to be long, but let's look at a few more scriptures. John 19, 28.
After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost that the scriptures might be fulfilled. Listen to 1 Corinthians 15, 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day, according to the, the scriptures. The entire word of God concerns Christ and him crucified. The blood began to flow in the garden. In the garden of Eden, blood was shed. And it didn't stop flowing. The blood was poured out throughout the ages until Christ said it's finished. Why did he die? To redeem his people from their sins. Titus 2.14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. That's why Christ died. If I'm a sinner, God must punish me. But if Christ hath suffered for my sins, God must bless me. He must let me go free. He redeemed us from all iniquity and purified us unto himself. He said to those in that other garden, if you seek me, let these go their way. That God might be just and justifier. That's why he died. Romans 3, 24 through 26. The holy God cannot let you live and still be the holy God unless his justice is satisfied regarding your sin. He can't just have died for mankind. He's got to have died for you. If you're going to stand just in his presence, there must be a substitute. Mere man has nothing to pay, and God can't die. But the God-man is my substitute. That he might be Lord. <laughs> Romans 14, 9, For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord, both of the dead and the living. That doesn't mean that he, was, he became Lord when he died. It means that when he died, he showed himself to be Lord of the dead and the living. He is revealed as the Lord of glory by his death and his resurrection. Because he died, every knee shall bow unto him. The universe was his as God, creator, but as a man, the man, he bought us. And he will do with you and me what he will. He gives life to whomsoever he will. And whom he will, he hardeneth. He died to that end. And he died that he might have the preeminence. Look at Colossians 1.12. Giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints 
in light. What must I do to inherit eternal life? That's not something you do. That's something God makes you. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or, princip or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. He has the preeminence because we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, by the death and resurrection of the image of the invisible God firstborn of every creature. So again, seeing then that we have such hope, seeing then that Christ is who he is, God Almighty, as the Father hath life in himself and quickeneth whom he will, even so, he's given authority, power to the Son to give life to whomsoever he will. Seeing then that we have such vital hope. Seeing then that we have such glorious hope. We use great plainness of speech. May God make it so. Let's all stand together and we'll sing number 62 from your hardback hymnal, number 62. 